come to save the day. Welcome to Mighty House. This is a show for people with problems. Home improvement problems, that is. And for people who want common sense guidance on how to build green and live a more sustainable lifestyle. Send an email. The Mighty House crew is on the job. This is Mighty House. All right, we're back. And today, we've got another instant request from a a listener, a viewer, a uh, Subscriber. subscriber. One of those. But anyway, we got an email from uh, someone and they kind of were getting confused about grounding and bonding, which I have to say most people do. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do that, make sure you hit that subscribe button, dingle on the bell, that way you get notified next time uh, we post something. And go ahead and leave a comment below because I know this is a very interesting topic um, if you're a geek. We'll just kind of clarify that right there because uh, this we're going to go into the weeds. I know we're going to try to stay out of the weeds, but we may end up there. So, all right. Do you want to start with the share right away? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with that. Okay. Let's, let's start with the share screen and go to the first. Um, there we go. There's our first. So we'll just clarify that grounding and bonding. I mean, they're two different processes or requirements on your electrical system and they're extremely important in your home but they seem redundant because of where you do some of the connections uh-huh but it's not it still has there's like different reasons for the two correct so and if when doing some research for this you go to the nfpa's website the national fire protection agency and if you read their definitions of, of grounding, um, you'll probably come away even more confused. And it was simply because they keep saying, make sure you take this grounded bonded to there. And it's so there, I think they mean, mean connect, not bond. Secure. You know I mean? They're saying bond like connect. And so then now that word is getting overused and then it becomes even more muddled, more confusing. Correct. So Correct. I think it's important to understand that Grounding can also be called earthing, depending on where you're in the country. Okay? Right. And it's also how the system is wired to create what they call a ground fault circuit. So that's the pathway to ground. Yes. That's your lighting, your outlet, your mechanicals, right? So, the, you know, think about an outlet, right? You have a hot, a neutral, and a ground. Yes. So now... That, if if you live in the Chicago land area and you have conduit, you've got your hot, your neutral, and then the uh, the metal box, the metal conduit, and that becomes your ground. That's why when you look at a, the extension cords that the rest of the country uses, called Romex, they have mm -hmm. that ground wire in there. Mm -hmm. That's taking place of what we have in our area of, of metal conduit. Right. So those those are interchangeable. And so that's providing the ground back to the panel. Right. So um, if you have, if you don't have Romex, that's why you don't always see a ground in there because the 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 pipe is the the EMT, the conduit does that for you. But a good point on that, those of you were to remove the outlet from the box and say it's still hot and you plug something in, your outlet may still work, but it's no longer grounded because Correct. you removed it from that metal. Correct. A lot of times you'll see a small green wire go from the back of the outlet to the back of the box. So that if you pull the outlet out, the outlet is still grounded. Right. And, you know, they that outlet could like get perfectly placed where the screw's not bonded to or sitting on there tight enough. And it can actually float in there. And now all of a sudden that outlet's no longer grounded. Would show an open ground when you do the test. Correct. So that's why you'll do the jumper off the outlet back to the, to the, um, to the box right and i can see that a lot if you're doing say kitchen outlets with a granite backsplash and you've got spacers in there you're relying on that screw to make good contact with the plastering in the back and that plastering has to make good contact with the box and the box so on correct so one of the primary purposes of the grounding goes for detection of faults in the electrical system and it provides a path for currents back from that fall point through the ground to the source's neutral point which is all so, that's right here 
Yeah. So when you think about that ground, all that stuff in the ground, it's also going to your neutral bar, but it's giving it path to earth or path to ground. So your neutral is always tied to that neutral bar. You've got your other bar. That one on the bottom of that service panel would be actually something for you to put, you know, if you had other pieces of equipment, whether it's a phone box, cable, whatever, those are your, where you're going to reattach those. <clears throat> So I think most places, like in the Chicago area, you can actually ground, which it shows here is like to your water pipe. You know, for the most part, you got three quarter or one inch copper K run out for your water service. So that's your ground. They put a strap or a saddle clamp on that, and that's your ground. Correct. We use plastic for our water lines. So we have to put in the ground rods, which are shown there. Right here. And then because we do all concrete block and slab, all of our rebar has to be, we have a building ground or a steel, building steel. So uh, on these ground rods, there's a minimum of two that it's required because there's no way to really test the impedance of these. So now that's why they're requiring two, minimum of six feet apart and eight feet long. So um, obviously different parts of the country, you can't get an eight foot ground rod in so that's why you've got these different types of wires, plates. There's all different sizes. And you've just, if you go to the NEC, that'll show you exactly all your different options for getting proper grounding. So with that, this, I think this was pretty, pretty interesting. The way you have to tie this in with your building steel. Mm-hmm. In, in your area, you're saying that this out actually goes up and then ties in to the yeah, rest of the Yeah, it would actually come building. up next to our, where your electrical panel is or your service entrance. So it would blow a hole in the block. And if you got a really good guy, which mine was, he put a, they put up a plaster ring, two gang plaster ring, so that there's a cover on there. But mm -hmm. now anybody needs to attach the building steel for, for ground and or bonding, which we'll get to next, then that way they have some place that is all it's guaranteed to work. It's guaranteed. It's all tied together. Right. So, okay. and like you said, that's a low impedance path for static charges, surges caused by environment, anything. It's getting it back to ground, to the earth. Correct. All right. So that is grounding. Right. So that brings us to bonding. So bonding. Bonding is the practice of intentionally. I like this. This definition actually came off Wikipedia. Okay. Electrical bonding is the practice of intentionally electrically connecting all exposed metal items not designed to carry electricity in a room or building as protection from electric shock. Bonding is also used to minimize electrical arcing between metal surfaces with electrical potential differences. Yes. So, so you want to talk about, uh, let's go to, a, I can just jump straight to a swimming pool and and what the potential is there. Okay. Go ahead. You want to explain that one and how you have to do that, at least, you know, for swimming pools so that that way. Well, ours, ours is probably a little different than yours in some respects. So because our, our building steel goes through our pool decks and our pool shells, all of that rebar is bonded together to begin with. But then we have another bond that come, has to go from the pool shell directly to the equipment so that we have an equipment bond so that there's no conduction through water, through pipe, whatever. So we have a, an equipment bond tying that pool together. So when I learned about bonding, I was actually building a job in, in Burr Ridge and I had a, a, an electrical inspector fail a bathroom inspection because the tub, my Whirlpool tub, was not bonded to the drain. And I had never done that before. And I asked him, you know, what's, I don't understand, what's the point of this? Right. And fortunately, it was a good inspector, or at least I asked the question properly. And he explained to me that because the drain is brass, my water line is copper, there's chrome on top of that. Brass and copper do not carry electricity at the same potential. There's a variance in how much electricity will flow on them. If you had a pacemaker and you were holding the shower valve, which happens to be brass, and you step on the drain or the water line, you know, anything connected to the copper, it literally could send milliamps through your body. 
mm -hmm. which most people would never notice. Right. But if you had a pacemaker, it could stop it. Yeah. And that's where all this kind of came from. And it started making a lot more sense after he told me that. And I also appreciated that. You know what I mean? It's like, right. okay, now I get it. And never had a problem bonding things since. <laughs> yeah. Because he took the time to explain it to you. Yeah. Well, because when you go online, it gets kind of confusing. So what's the practical reason, right? What is it really helping? Right. Well, that's what it is. It's really about trying to keep the potential the same in all your dissimilar metals in your home or business for that matter. Right. So this one we're showing where we have our ground over right. there in the bottom left. And then that goes to your neutral terminal block. But you can see the bond jumper and the chase way all the way to the right and to the left, there's where you're bonding. So now that case is gonna carry the same. They do the same thing when they get into the sub panels, they put another bond on there. So if I was to touch the chase or the panel below, the boxes are gonna be exactly the same. I'm not gonna have a different in potential. Right. That's your service. So that next slide I think is really good for more, more for homeowners. Yeah. This is what needs to be done in your utility. And a lot of the home inspectors today are picking up on this, not not the municipal inspectors, but the home inspectors that come in when you buy a house, you're selling a house. They're picking up on this now. And we're well, if you look at the uh, bottom of the water heater, look who copyrighted this. So we have to give them credit. Oh, hey, Nachi. Yeah, Internachi. <laughs> yep, international, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we've done a lot of stuff with Nachi in the past and, you know, done some of their training and, and had them on it even in the past, you know. Right. So I thought this was actually a really good drawing of what we're trying to talk about. And probably more importantly is when you see that water line on the top there and where the water meter is, you see they put a jumper across. Right. Because if you pull that water meter out, guess what happens? That, yeah, you no longer have... You're breaking your bonds. So you right. have to put the jumper over the meter. Same thing with your water heater. Just because the two lines go in there doesn't mean they're going to have the same potential. So you jump her across over the water heater. Right. Because if that is... that For some reason, you drain that out. And not, now you have the... Uh, you, have, you don't have the water to be able to complete that connection. I guess the one thing that's missing here is if this is a gas dryer... They also require you to go from one side, one pipe down to the gas pipe also. Yeah, I didn't find, I could not find any that actually showed the gas pipe, but that's, I made that comment earlier, but yes, you'd want to bond your gas pipe. So these are, yeah, these are fairly important here that you got to watch out for this one. And then you should have one more that goes down to the gas if you've got a gas water heater. Mm -hmm. and, and that way you're, you're tying all that together and you're eliminating all those potentials uh, and differences there. So, so do you think we've made this any easier to understand? Um, I don't know about us. I think the <laughs> pictures help. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I guess I, I'd almost have to say, if you got questions, drop them down below. We'll go ahead and uh, do our best to answer them and steer you in the right direction, and. Uh, just to circle back to what caused this uh, topic to come up in the first place is someone opened up an electrical oven that they had, and it had a ground, an isolated ground coming from the panel to the outlet. And he had some friends that were telling him he needed to then put a jumper from that to the electric box also. But that's already already bonded back to the panel. There's no reason to tie those two together. Right. If there was an electrical shock, you know, now you no longer have an isolated ground from your appliance back to the panel because you've bonded it to the to the uh, electrical box. So right. you don't want to do that. So if if you have a a four a, a four conductor outlet, it has a ground, you put your ground in there that's isolated back to the panel here. So that's where that goes. And that's what started the whole the whole topic. We just want to make sure nobody gets shocked. And this is the bonding and grounding 
are, are really important and you need to make sure that, that it's all done correctly. I'm going to say with that, keep it square and level. Till next time. Till next time. There you go. All right. And uh, go. don't get shocked. Don't get shocked. <laughs>